good evening everyone um, a warm welcome to isu usi radio smart learning program as you are all aware that uh, a very important topic uh, radio nucleides in urology and uh, these topics are being covered by none other than the eminent faculty in the field of uh, nuclear medicine uh, we have uh, uh, dr murli from bangalore and uh, uh, dr sumit from kmc uh, manipal uh you know both have a lot of uh, work in the area of uh, the radio nucleides in urology and uh, both have been very active in participating in the national and international conferences and uh, are well thought of uh, thought out uh, speaker for various uh, conferences and cmas um so on behalf of indian school of urology warm welcome to both of you and uh, dear ladies and you are aware that the, the four topics which we have kept uh, they are not only important for uh, you when you are seeing the patient and how to read the dms how to estimate the dfr and uh, how to uh, see the interpretation of uh, psr capacity what to make out of the of the of the report uh, but it is uh, important as comes as a note it can come as a note in the recent advances or it can come as a a note in the basic sciences so uh, in different forms uh, uh, but examiners are fond of uh, asking uh, by your particular exam if you get a case of phd exception they are fond of asking about dmsa if you get a case of uh, dur and when you have a metastatic cleft or uh, prostate cancer and then is the the location of pcp so without too much ado i'll just say why to dr dr mohit to uh, start his presentation Uh, he'll be talking about the dietary program and uh, uh, the estimation of the overall DPT. Uh, followed by, we'll have Kumi talking about uh, DMS and the PSM per CP. Over to you, Dr. Mudli. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thanks for this uh, uh, nice introduction and wonderful words. Uh, I hope everybody is seeing my slides screen. Yes. Go. Go ahead, sir. my audio audio is also good right so 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 to begin with i just wanted to start this topic with a brief introduction on the concepts of nuclear medicine so in nuclear medicine we use different radio isotopes of usually short uh, half life like technetium 99m thallium gallium 67 fluorine 18 gallium 68 so many things these isotopes emit different types of radiation like alpha beta gamma or positron and depending upon what type of radiation they emit we use it either for imaging or for therapy for example technetium emits gamma rays and it is suitable for uh, imaging so we use it for uh, labeling with different compounds like dtpa dmsa mib hida or mdp and the way the body handles these organs in the body they are uh, they are used for different organ imaging for example dtpa is handled through the kidneys by gfr so technetium dtpa scan is used for Uh, renal scintigraphy, especially GFR estimation and outflow tract. Similarly, EC and MAC they are also used for outflow tract imaging. DMS is used for renal cortical imaging. Uh, similarly, we have multiple other tracers, numerous tracers for different organ imaging that we will not uh, uh, study here. So it's out of scope of this presentation. Now this is also important production of radio isotopes. They are produced either in nuclear reactor or cyclotrons. All over world there are only five sites where the bulk of the radio tracers are produced since uh, uh, we have a very limited site and whenever uh, they go for maintenance and all we have shortage of supply or uh, whenever uh, uh, even in ukraine war there is supply chain disturbances so this is important because when the clinicians know it and uh, they are empathizing with us uh, it is easier for us to explain to the patients the most common tracer uh, uh, radio isotope what we use that is technetium 99m is supplied in a self shielded container called as generator from this generator we every day we elute radioactivity and we label it with ddpa or dmsa or different tracers and since technetium has a half life of 6 hours the elution happens in the uh, early in the morning so as the evening uh, i mean as the day passes uh, sometimes we have shortage of radio isotope this also has to be borne in mind so cyclotron is other uh, way of production of radio isotopes where like uh, we produce uh, f18 ftg n13 ammonia c11 compounds uh, so many other uh, isotopes here again the isotope has only 2 hour half life and 
uh, uh, if the clinician knows and tells the patients that taking a proper appointments and all is very important, it becomes easy for us also to explain to the patients that uh, 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 the waiting period will be there. So many other physiological, these are all physiological things. So we, a lot of times we face problems from the uh, patients that uh, the scan is not uh, done properly. They take too many images, they make us wait and all. So this is important. If the clinician knows, they can help the patients. I mean, they can prime the patients and we can also handle the patients very well. Now, applications of nuclear medicine in nephro-urology. So as we all know, the indications are for evaluation of obstruction, renal function, where we can estimate GFR or effective renal plasma flow. We can get split function, differential function, then infection imaging, congenital anomalies, masses, vesicoureteric reflux, renal failure, renal vascular hypertension, surgical comp complications, renal transplant evaluation, and trauma. So in my, in my talk, I will be covering uh, obstruction evaluation and renal function evaluation. So there are different radio tracers. And depending upon what clinical question you have, we can use different radio tracers. For example, if the perfusion is the question, then MAG3 or EC are the better agents compared to DTPA and GHA. For renal morphology evaluation, DMSA and GHA are better than EC and MAG3. For obstruction evaluation, EC or MAG3 are better than DTPA. For split function, again, EC and DMSA are better than GHA, MAG3 and DTPA. For GFR quantitation, DTPA is better. For ERPF quantitation, EC and MAG3 are better. So now MAG3 is mercaptoacetyl triglycine, EC is ethylene disestinate, DTPA is diethylene triamine pentaacetic acid, DHA is glucoheptonic acid, and DMSA is dimercaptosuccinic acid. So now coming to renal dynamic scan or diuretic renogram, commonly called as DTPA scan. I rarely get a prescription telling diuretic renal scan or diuretic renal scintigraphy. Commonly, the prescription says it is DTPA scan. But it is up to us to decide whether we are really going to do DTPA or we are going to do EC. And what is the difference between these three different radio tracers? I will explain in later slides. So basically, what does renal dynamic scan mean? It means assessment of tracer flow in, through, and out of the kidney. There are three phases perfusion phase, parenchymal phase, and clearance phase. So the tracers used are technetium 99M, DTPA, MAC3, or EC. Now, when you compare these three tracers, DTPA is, uh, you have to uh, refresh a little bit of our radio, uh, sorry, pharmacokinetic uh, understanding what we had studied in second year MBBS. So you have to know plasma clearance, renal handling, extraction efficiency, urinary clearance, protein binding, and these factors will determine kidney to background uh, ratio and what is the information what we get on a renal cortical outline. So plasma clearance means some amount of radio tracer is injected into the blood. The X amount of radio tracer is uh, injected into the blood. How much of it is cleared from a different organ? For example, DTPA is uh, handled by kidney. So more than 95% of DTPA is cleared from the kidney. Whereas in MAC3, 60% is cleared from the kidney and 40% is by liver. Whereas EC, more than 95% is cleared only through the kidney. This is important because whenever there is a renal function impairment, alternate route of excretion takes predominance. For example, in case of MAC3, whenever serum creatinine is high, like impaired renal, global impaired renal function is there, then alternate route of excretion through the liver happens and that can interfere with image evaluation. Whereas with DTPA and EC, it is almost exclusively handed through kidneys only. But in case of DTPA, more than 95% is cleared by glomerular filtration. In case of MAC3, 95% is cleared by tubular secretion and 5% by glomerular filtration. And in case of EC, 85% is cleared by tubular secretion and 15% by glomerular filtration. So, and another important thing is extraction efficiency. What does it mean is through one flow in and out of the kidney, like 100% uh, percent of uh, a tracer is going through the renal artery. When it comes through the renal vein, how much of it is extracted by the kidney? In case of DTPA, it is only 15%. In case of MAC3, it is 50%. And in case of EC, it is around 60 to 70%.
So because of this, the plasma T half of DTPA is 80 to 100 minutes, MAC3 is 40 to 80 minutes, and EC is 30 to 50 minutes. This is also very important because the kidney to background ratio is very good in case of EC because of high renal extraction and high uh, renal handling. Whereas with MAC3, it is still better, but whenever global impaired renal function is there, hepatic excretion can happen. So kidney to background uh, ratio can get affected. In case of DTPA, since it is exclusively handled by kidney, but uh, extraction efficiency is only 15%, whenever there is global impaired renal function, the technetium DTPA keeps circulating in the body. So the background kidney to background ratio becomes very bad. So there are literature support in all patients, the target to background ratio in case of DTPA and EC, much, much better in case of EC. Uh, even when creatinine is less than 2 mg or whenever creatinine is more than 2, in all the uh, cases, the kidney to background ratio is very high in case of EC or the, then comes MAC3 and then comes DTPA. So this is important because whenever you, are, you want to evaluate uh, renal outflow, uh, in the background of uh, impaired renal function, for example, if the creatinine is 2 and above, you always insist for tubular secretion, tubular secreting agents like EC. In case of uh, DTPA, if the creatinine becomes 2.5 and above, uh, many a times it becomes very difficult to, to see the kidneys itself. So for us to calculate uh, split function and all will become very difficult. So now renal dynamics can, whenever you are requesting your prescription, it is always uh, better if you provide relevant history like clinical signs of obstruction, like fang pain, reduced urine volume, increased urgency or frequency, pertinent laboratory data, especially most recent creatinine values, prior imaging data, uh, information about relevant urological procedures like any nephrostomy tubes or uh, uh, catheterization or stents have been done and any patient, if the patient is on any diuretic medication and dosages and check whether the patient is pregnant or breastfeeding and also specify the questions you, uh, which are to be answered. Uh, well, coming to pregnancy, I will talk later. Renal dynamic scan, the preparation is adequate hydration. Oral liquids, add libitum or 5 to 10 ml per kg body weight, 30 to 60 minutes before the procedure. Breastfeeding, 20 to 30 minutes before the procedure. Or in case if the patient is not able to take orally, we can give IV fluids at 10 to 15 cc per kg per uh, uh, minute. Then uh, usually scan is acquired in supine position, intravenous injection followed by image acquisition. We have different phases, as I said, flow phase in two to three seconds per frame for one minute. Then parenchymal plus clearance phase, we acquire for 15 to 30 seconds per frame for 15 to 30 minutes. Static image at the end of the study, pre-void and post-void, and a delayed static image at two to four hours. So pregnancy and lactation no longer are considered absolute contraindications. If, they, uh, if you want a real information, the amount of radiation dose from a renal dynamic scan is not very significant. It is much slightly more than an X-ray, but much, much less than a CT abdomen. So especially if the patient in second trimester and if you want to really intervene on the patient, uh, we can do a renal scan even if the patient is pregnant. Just we have to make sure in today's era, a multidisciplinary uh, uh, permission is needed. And if you want, we can take uh, opinion of a legal counsel also to save ourselves in future. Breastfeeding again is not uh, contraindication and interruption of breastfeeding is also not needed. And uh, all the task forces, the ANM task force and uh, International Council uh, Commission on Radiological ICRP always recommend no cessation of breastfeeding. So diuresis intervention is done in the form of uh, frusamid injection at 0.5 to 1 mg per kg. Adult standard 40 mg. There are different protocols like F plus 15 or plus 20. That is, uh, first isotope is injected and the frusamid is injected at 15 minutes or 20 minutes after the scan after the isotope injection, or we can have an F minus 15 where frusamide injected 15 minutes before the isotope injection and F zero protocol is where we inject F uh, frusamide along with isotope injection. So F zero protocol nowadays has become most popular because it is equally effective as uh, uh, F plus 15 and avoids double injection, reduces acquisition time, reduces motion artifact, and also physiologically, the peak effect of uh, LASIKs coincides with peak pelvic calicial filling time. 
So F minus fifteen protocol is uh, reserved in certain cases, like in post pyeloplasty or when there is a gross dilated uh, pelvic calcium system. Whenever renal function uh, is impaired, then more fusamide has to be injected, like ATMG if creatinine value is elevated, or uh, uh, clearance rate is reduced by fifty percent or more. So bladder catheterization is not required in most cases. If gross hydroeurethronephrosis is there, it is preferred. Or whenever you want to evaluate VUJ obstruction or ectopic kidney with hydronephrosis or in neurogenic bladder, bladder catheterization is preferred. So well-tempered renogram is done in children uh, at least one month after. Uh, this is an examination question, but it is not practically done. Just for uh, uh, examination point of view, I am telling what is well-tempered renogram. So it is done in children. Oral hydration at less than two hours before. Uh, IV hydration, DNS or NS at 15 ml per kg for 30 minutes before the scan and during the scan. Catheterization in all patients. Preferable tracer is MAG3. Prusamide at 1 mg per kg. However, it is not universally allowed. Catheterization is painful. Uh, IV diuresis is painful and leads to motion artifacts and other such things. So, uh, what we follow regularly is F0 protocol uh, with a without catheterization in most of the patients. Now, coming to interpretation. So first we have to assess the kidney location, size, and orientation. Then kidney to background ratio, and any abnormal activity like indirect evidence of UR or leak or collection, and any uh, motion artifacts, any extravasation. All these things have to be uh, studied. Differential function, split function is then assessed. Then pattern of renogram curves, the way it is peaking, a clearance is happening, and also assess for artifacts. So normal. This is a normal renal scan. We have a parenchymal, uh, sorry, perfusion phase where you can see two kidneys seen mm -hmm. in normal position appear normal in size. In parenchymal phase, the kidney to background ratio increases. There is progressive accumulation in the kidney, and then there is a uh, the urinary bladder is normally seen at three to five minutes, and subsequently from the kidney tracer uh, keeps on washing, and the renal activity becomes faint and the Uh, bladder activity becomes more. Uh, in case of children, uh, child can pass urine in between, and you can assess the bladder is emptied, and then we assess renogram curves, then split function. So it is always important first see the images, then make a mental assessment, then you go for renogram curves and split function, because so many uh, errors happen, which I will explain later. This is. on a monitor we also see the cine images you can very well see both kidneys being perfused almost equally this is perfusion phase then this is cortical phase then there is a clearance phase from the kidney it is clearing into the bladder so renogram curve has a vascular phase which is uh, shown by initial upslope then a parenchymal phase and then excretory phase there are different types of curves also called as orally curves uh, Uh, this is basically uh, done in f plus 15 so this is a normal curve this is an obstructive classical curve where after the initial peaking there is progressive up sloping in case of uh, redundant clustering system but non obstructed after uh, diuresis injection there is prompt clearance and in equivocal type 3b again after diuresis there is no prompt clearance but there is a slow clearance and delayed compensation is another Uh, type of curve where there is initial clearance but subsequently again there is filling however uh, the renogram curve has lot of limitations so please please don't just see uh, only the curve for making a assumption of obstruction or not you always have to see the parenchymal phase and the main, uh, and the images don't lie the curves can lie the uh, split function can lie even a physician can lie a nuclear medicine physician can lie but the images don't lie so always see the images then make a mental interpretation your renogram curve and your split function is just for corroboration of your interpretation so the curve depends upon type of radio tracer duration of the scan degree of renal function cortical transit what type of pelvic calcium system you have whether it is intra renal extra renal or degree of dilatation whether it's a pyeloplasty with a redundant collecting system all these factors govern even a patient motion and if there is if there is any injection or extravasation or if the reflux reflux is happening the renogram curve gets affected 
so now a uh, few classical examples as i said you make a mental picture by seeing the images here you can see conventionally renogram is assessed from the posterior aspect so the left kidney is uh, the uh, I mean the kidney on the left side of the image is left kidney of the patient and kidney on the right side is right kidney but in case of ectopic kidney or in case of horseshoe kidney we also assess anterior images where the orientation is inverse so here you can see the right kidney is normal in size and uh, with uh, time uh, the right kidney is completely clearing in uh, but whereas the left kidney is enlarged it shows impaired function and uh, impaired perfusion and cortical tracer concentration and there is progressive accumulation and between early and delayed images hardly any clearance is there from the left kidneys so here then you see the uh, renogram curve is here i follow a red curve for right and blue curve for left here you can see the right curve is promptly down sloping and left curve is going up so this is a classical case of poj obstruction and so uh, this is another case where you can see the right kidney is enlarged left kidney is better perfused and clearing whereas right kidney there is progressive accumulation now what is differential function is contribution of each kidney to the total function it is measured by counting individual kidney counts by putting a region of interest around the kidney divided by total counts that is left and right kidney counts multiplied by 100 so importance of region of interest is very important whether it is cortical or whole kidney whether it is what time it is calculated and other things so visual assessment i feel is much better than uh, computer derived assessment because uh if the if there is a large intrarenal pelvis and if the region of interest is drawn around the pelvis even if there is a balloon dot pelvis and if you re include the region of interest around the balloon pelvis the counts in that uh, region of interest increases and the function of the kidney gets overestimated so all guidelines insist for tubular agents for uh, outflow evaluation i explained previously only mac3 or ec iodine ortho iodide hypoperate is not available nowadays so we rely on technetium traces like ec or mac3 uh, is much better than dtpa and for interpretation there are several quantitative parameters like t half time to peak peak to 20% ratio peak to uh, 3 minute ratio so many other things but none of them are reliable for example only snm relies society of nuclear medicine Uh, relies on t half where they say values less than 10 minutes is normal 10 to 20 minutes is equivocal and more than 20 minutes are assessed uh, as interpreted as obstruction however european association and even in india we don't rely only on t half or uh, peak to half ratio or peak to 3 minute ratio uh, so eanm says the quality of drainage measured in the post micturition image also called as normalized residual activity is better than only t half so they have uh, developed a cut off of 0.5 uh, 0.5 to 1.8 or more than 1.8 so all the guidelines they say t max image mean transit time have not shown to be useful to differentiate between simple dilatation versus high probability of obstruction <clears throat> it is very important to assess the first 1 to 2 minutes parenchymal phase image which is also called as a parametric image and it gives very good information about cortical impairment of the function so no conclusion can be given only based on these values so output efficiency and nora are what enm uh, advocates but these are derived from software and currently our no nuclear medicine system softwares give these values so we have to rely manually and we have to develop a, a, a manual calculations which again are uh, quite subjective and uh, subject to interpretation errors so what we do instead is we assess early images and delayed images in a delayed image if there is a persistent uptake so then it means there is high probability of uh, obstruction so you have to assess first to 1 to 2 3 minutes of parenchymal phase then assess the early image and delayed image based on that you make a interpretation whether it is obstructed or not and also take into consideration ultrasound parameters like parenchymal thickness and ap diameter 
so it is the finally uh, everyone re recommends that in case of obstruction or better the definition of risk factors for renal deterioration is a matter of debate and it is the task of the surgeon to take into consideration all the data available like renogram data ultrasound data parenchymal thickness ap diameter everything before making a conclusion of obstruction and whether to intervene or not so a few examples here you can see if you rely on uh, only renogram curve you can see even though right kidney is enlarged the curve is plateaued suddenly there is fall does it mean uh, it is not obstructed no because in early and delayed images there is complete clearance happening and the function of the right kidney is fairly preserved it is 47% so what is happening is so the last see every image is acquired for 30 seconds or for uh, 15 seconds and then group suppose if we stop in between let us say after 18 minutes the many attempts patient says my bladder is full i want to stop then we have to stop immediately so on that last frame is acquired for only 5 seconds in that second the curve counts is very less and the curve suddenly drops so this is these are all the caveats in uh, relying only on the images this is another patient if you see there is left hydro urethronephrosis it is clearing but in initial post void image there is persistent hold up but in delayed images there is persist complete clearance so this is non obstructed hydro urethronephrosis here there is another case in the left kidney uh, upper pole there is uh, 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 much reduced uh, perf uh, perfusion and cortical uptake compared to lower pole whereas the lower pole has completely cleared upper pole there is progressive accumulation but the renogram curve is showing complete clearance so here again if you see the delayed image there is complete clearance only focal uptake is uh, there this is because this patient had upper pole calyctasis with a stone which had absorbed the radioactivity so initially there was photopenia because of the stone but subsequently it is clearing another differential diagnosis in such cases is a duplex system so this is another case where you can see both the uh, background activity is increased this is what i was highlighting if normally you don't see this much background activity so whenever you see this much background activity it means both kidney function is impaired or insufficient and here the bladder activity is also not seen up to almost 14 minutes so there is significant obstructive component uh, in bilateral puja ureters are not seen you can see concavity initially which becomes convex later so there is cortical tracer transit is also delayed and there is progressive accumulation with persistent obstruction it's bilateral puja obstruction so this is another case with bilateral vuj obstruction the patient had clamp initially so uh, pelvic axial to ureteric clearance was not happening but once the clamp was removed uh, ureteric activity was seen i think renal transplant evaluation also renal scan can be used for uh, acute rejection and chronic rejection in acute rejection there is impaired perfusion and uh, impaired uh, uh, significant background activity uh, will be there uh, and uh, there is hardly any clearance whereas in atn uh, the perfusion will be better but hardly any clearance the renogram curve will be plateaued however nowadays with the advent of biopsies uh, the indications for transplant evaluation is much less again in as inhibitor renography for reno vascular hypertension also earlier we used to use uh, a lot of such cases but now with the advent of a very good the uh, uh, ct coronary and the ct uh, renal angiogram the indications for renal scan has become very less the main indication is to see salvageability or not if the kidney is contracted and if the kidney function is much less than 15% then it is better not to salvage is what is developing so this and all we will not discuss for lack of time the other topic what i had is gfr estimation so gfr estimation you know uh, the ideal method is by inulin clearance which is a large sugar molecule which fulfills the all criteria for ideal filtration marker however it is not practical in clinical practice it because it requires a continuous steady state infusion of insulin uh, sorry inulin and also 24 hour urine collection for complete bladder emptying and uh, serial plotting of the curve which is very cumbersome 
urea clearance is another method but it is not accurate because it is influenced by protein intake state of hydration or presence of gi bleed and infection creatinine is now most popular because it's an endogenous marker handled by the kidneys in a similar manner to insulin inulin but it is uh, and its uh, uh, values can be used to measure gfr by different formula the most popular are uh, cockroft gold or mdrd or ckd epi however this is again has its own limitation like serum uh, creatinine is dependent on age age associated decrease in renal function and muscle mass or muscle injury and it is not very sensitive in detecting early deterioration of renal function ideally 24 hour urine creatinine clearance has to be done but uh, it is not practical cystatin c is now again another method but it is not widely available so these are some formula if you want later you can see therefore isotopic clearance that is uh, gfr or uh, mac3 clearance or effective renal plasma flow uh, estimation uh, have become quite popular in isotopic clearance we have ideally Uh, uh, chromium 51 EDTA is a better agent, but it, chromium 51 is not universally available. Therefore, we use technetium 90 nm DTPA. So here we have two ways of estimation. One is called as in vitro method, and other one is called as in vivo method. In in vitro method, after isotope injection, we take uh, serial samples at uh, maybe 30 minutes, 60 minutes. 90 minutes like up to 4 hours also you can take multiple blood samples and uh, measure the counts in those samples and plot against uh, a time and correct for physical decay and estimate t half so that is one way of method but here it again requires a uh, serial blood sample estimation uh, and a well counter is needed which is not available universally so in vivo method is what is most commonly used that is by gamma camera method where there is a complex formula called as uh, gates formula which takes into consideration several factors which will not discuss here uh, so, and uh, this uh, uh, here what happens is we draw region of interest around the kidney and also a uh, region of interest on the background away from the kidney and and the machine calculates automatically based on the renogram curve renal depth and uptake fraction it automatically calculates split function but what is important is uh, many places they give only absolute gfr this absolute gfr is an individual kidney gfr for inter individual assessment you have to get something called as normalized gfr which is based on 1.73 meter square body surface area so whenever somebody has given only gfr you should also insist for normalized gfr and especially in donor evaluation it is not the absolute gfr which is more important but it is it is the normalized gfr where patient's height patient's weight is taken into consideration and the values derived are normalized for 1.73 meter square body surface area several studies have been done comparing mdrd versus ckd epi versus dtpa gfr uh, and it is known that ckd epi or mdrd Uh, values are lesser than dtpa gfr but again in dtpa gfr in vitro method is superior uh, than in vivo method and in vivo method protein binding or any injection related uh, factors will definitely affect so in many countries instead of dtpa they are using mac3 clearance because previously i showed you in the first uh, pharmacokinetics uh, slide that mac3 has much lesser protein binding and better tubular excretion so in usa mac3 clearance is used for kidney donors and a normal value is uh, 320 plus or minus 95 ml per minute per 1.73 meter square body surface area ec ec i told you is a better agent than mac3 and in ec the clearance is around 400 plus or minus 70 ml per uh, minute per 1.73 meter square body surface area so uh indirectly you can estimate gfr like 1/4 of ec clearance is gfr as you know uh, erpf is effective renal plasma flow gfr and erpf are in the ratio of 1 is to 5 or 1 is to 4 uh, like that so if you get a ec clearance you can uh, uh, estimate gfr also by dividing it by 4 
So this is our center in Bangalore. We have a gamma camera and PET CT and also radio iodine therapy facility. So any questions are there, I'm happy to answer. Uh, Dr. Malik, thank you. One question has come from uh, the chat box. I'll take uh, the question is from Javed. Uh, now he wants to know, uh, you were mentioning about uh, the F0 and F uh, plus 15 that uh, they are more or less the same. He is asking why minus 15 protocol is preferred in post chiropathy. But do you think it is preferred? First channel. And no, personally, I don't prefer. Personally, I don't prefer. See, what happens is in in case of large renal pelvis, especially when if it is an intrarenal pelvis, so the gravity assisted clearance will not be there. So, uh, and post pyeloplasty, some nerve injury can happen, which will make the renal pelvic axial system redundant. So, here we think that if uh, diuretic effect is uh, at the same time as isotope injection. I said normally the peak diuretic effect is around 10 to 15 minutes after frusamide injection. So therefore we inject it 15 minutes before uh, isotope injection so that when isotope is injected by that time itself, we want a peak diuretic effect also to be there. So we think theoretically it is better, but uh, in my practical experience, I don't find it very useful. So I have my own protocol where I inject susamide one hour after the uh, early image, after the first injection. For example, post pyeloplasty after one hour also, if there is persistent holdup, if you inject susamide again and in subsequent delayed image, if it clears clearance, then I will report it as a redundant collecting system with the sluggish clearance. And if the patient is symptomatic and if there is persistent holdup, even after a second uh, LASIX injection, then I report it as possibility of uh, recurrent fuge obstruction. So I find F plus 60 is better than F minus 15 in case of post pyeloplasty, but it is not available in literature, but I have my own, every day I do around 15 to 20 renal scans, uh, both in adults and children. And this I only have uh, devised, and I feel it is quite better than even F minus 50. Okay. Now, Modi, the other thing, when you are uh, uh, doing this diuretic renogram, do you ever uh, ask the patient or ask the clinician to send you the ultrasound report? What is the size of the pelvis? Uh, how much is the dilatation? And based on that, you change your protocol. It's just you make it F0 uh, protocol for every patient, it's the standard. Uh, sir, pre-pyeloplasty, most of the time it is F0, irrespective of ultrasound findings. We do take into consideration ultrasound findings at the time of interpretation of the images. But as far as protocol is considered, uh, in a uh, naive patient, I mean, uh, uh, initial staging patient, uh, F-15, I don't follow whether whatever is the ultrasound findings. In post-pyeloplasty cases, rarely I follow F-15. And especially you know, some uh, urologists uh, insist for F minus 50. Otherwise, I use F plus 60, what I was telling just now. Yeah. Uh, Sumit, you have any different answer or you, you're, uh, uh, you're concerned? Sir, uh, you for in our center, our center also F0 universally followed for all. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah I think um, we'll go ahead with the. Uh, but Sumit, your uh, presentation, then we'll see what uh, one thing. Just um, uh, Sumit, yes. before uh, there are uh, one question from Shravan. Uh, any false positive DTPA or false DTPA negative DTPA? False negative DTPA is in and it's yeah. any condition. Yeah, uh, definitely. I told you whenever there is minor renal function impairment for whatever reason, whether dehydration, urine infection, or uh, because of uh, uh, renal calculi, uh, you and if, or if there is a uh, mild extravasation while injecting. In all such cases, renal cortical transit can get delayed, and the uh, curve can become slowly upsloping, and the clearance is also quite delayed. So, in such cases, false positive can occur. So we have to be very careful. That is why I tell every patient we have to take clinical history, whether he had any infection, whether he had any dehydration, vomiting, diarrhea in the recent past, 
or he has not taken water for whatever reason a fever patient with fever we had excessive uh, uh, what you call uh, imperceptible uh, uh, water loss in all such cases false positive can occur false negative that means if there is an obstruction but not uh, uh, renal scan negative it is very very rare only thing in what can happen is overestimation of function i told you overestimation of function like many a times i get 50% renal function ap diameter of 1.8 cm parenchymal thickness uh, 5 mm whether to operate or not is it false negative no 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 i will say it is error in the judgment of the technician if we rely too much on the technician processed image who have drawn a whole kidney region of interest in all such cases function of the kidney gets overestimated so that we have to be extremely careful in my case every renal scan i only process i draw a region of interest around the renal cortex or i direct the technician to draw a region of interest around the renal cortex i told you the first 1 to 2 minute image is a parametric image it gives maximum information about renal function so that is the false negative uh, uh, other than that i don't think any false negative scan is Yeah, we'll keep a watch over the chat box. Any new question comes, we'll take up at the end. Uh, Sumit, over to you now, Sumit, for your presentation. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> sir, my slides are visible. So it's visible nice yes sir okay so good evening everyone and uh, thank you sir for inviting me for the talk so i would like to request all the uh, registrars who are attending whatever uh, you feel you know you may ask and don't think that uh, any question might be you know might look uh, foolish or stupid uh, not at all you are most welcome to ask as many questions if it is interactive uh, the presentation will be equally good okay so my topics are dmsa and psma pet ct so the first is uh, dmsa as uh, dr murli told it is uh, a dimer caprosuccinic acid so what is dmsa dmsa is a cortical binding agent 40% of the uh, injected activity actually stays in the tubular cells so once it is injected as you have seen in dtpa or ec it does not excrete into the uh, bladder it where 40% of it actually stays within the kidney tubular cells so that after we inject we can have good amount of uh, time to image the entire kidneys radiation dose most of people have asked this again because dmsa is usually done in pediatrics uh, young children the radiation dose is very less as compared to your x ray or uh, ct scan so adult is 0.19 millisievert uh, etc and for an 5 year old it will be 0.45 so what is the mechanism of uptake actually dmsa is filtered through the gfr uh, glomerular apparatus only however it is taken up by the megalin tubulin complex which is present in the uh, proximal convoluted tubule tubular cells so just remember that it is not tubular secretion it just comes through gfr and it is taken up again by the tubular cells what are the indications for doing the dms scan so first is acute pyelonephritis once you do a ultrasound you don't find any particular foci then you can usually send it for dmsa it is a like gold standard for identifying the focus of uh, infection in the kidney renal scars as you all know post pyelonephritis when you are evaluating you want to evaluate uh, whether it has caused any scarring to the kidney or not we can use dmsa the third one is to look for an ectopic kidney so this is very important so if your ectopic kidney is seen uh, already on ultrasound then uh, it depends on the clinical uh, scenario like if it's an obstructed uh, kidney ectopic kidney already seen in uh, ultrasound 
uh, hydronephrotosis is seen, etc., then you choose diuretic renogram. Whereas if the kidney is not visualized on ultrasound, then you choose DMSA, renal anomalies also. So we'll go one by one. This is the protocol. We inject the child or adult with uh, suitable dose. And then two hours later, the imaging is done. Since most of the DMSA is uh, held within the tubular cells, we have this uh, liberty. This is how a normal DMSA looks like. If I can use a pointer. Okay, so this is how a normal DMSA looks like. The cortex usually appears very smooth. There is very less uh, bladder activity and background activity is very low. This is because just before the scan, the patient is, we ask the patient to void and then come for the scan. So you can see two beautiful kidneys here with the normal smooth curve, uh, cortex. So what happens in acute pyelonephritis? Uh, just the just one, uh, uh, Sumit, uh, Sumit, one question come from chat box is telling no slides visible. Uh, oh. I think uh, I am seeing that. Uh, we'll take a call from somebody else whether slides. Anyone are else who's not who is, uh, seeing the slides? No, no, I am seeing the slides. Yes. Dr. Murlik, are you seeing uh, uh, the, the slides up for Dr. Sumit? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I am seeing. Yeah, yeah. So uh, as is Abhinav also, and this is the. Yeah, so maybe his uh, competition. So yeah, I'm sorry to yeah. disturb you. Please go ahead. Okay, okay, sir. Okay, no problem. So in acute pyelonephritis, what happens? So a cold defect is seen. Okay, uh, if you see, this is the left kidney and this is the right kidney. Usually in acute pyelonephritis, you can actually see the cortical outline. However, the radio tracer uptake is less than the normal cortex. Okay. This is usually seen in acute pyelonephritis. However, in scarring, I will just show you. Okay, this is how a scar looks like. There is an abrupt cutoff of the cortex. If you compare with a, uh, acute pyelonephritis, you can actually see the cortical outline, but the radio tracer uptake is decreased. However, in scar, it is not so. However, it is difficult usually uh, in day-to-day -day practice, you know, to differentiate clear cut. It is usually correlated uh, with the clinical picture. If the patient is suffering from an acute pyelonephritic episode, ultrasound is not picking up any uh, foci. You send for a DMSA scan. If you see a photopenic area, then that is the foci of a pyelonephritis. Focal or bilateral, everything you can see. Whereas for scarring, you need to do it after six months post uh, the first uh, the, uh, acute pyelonephritis episode. If you see any photopenic area during a febrile period, four, six months post the acute pyelonephritis, then it is a scar. However, there are multiple pitfalls here in BMSA. Cold effects are not only seen during uh, acute pyelonephritis or for the scars, it is also seen if there is calyactasis. If there are multiple cysts, if there is a tumor which is involving the renal cortex, trauma, be it contusion, laceration, rupture, hematoma, etc., on the uh, renal cortex or an infarct, all of these will show up as cold defects, which are not scars. And in bilaterally poorly functioning kidneys, since this BMSA is also filtered through GFR itself. Once GFR is poor in CKD5 patients with threatened is sky high, in those patients, the DMSA images looks like this. Most of them it is cleared by the liver. And here you can see, you know, tiny uh, kidneys. And we can hardly make out any scars, whether it is normal, etc., etc. So doing a DMSA scan in uh, CKD4, 5 patients, etc., is not useful. Coming to ectopic kidneys, so as I said, this uh, DMSA scan is done to look for an ectopic kidney, okay? So it is once a uh, ectopic kidney is already diagnosed, I mean, you know, and there is an ectopic kidney, look for the findings in an ultrasound. If there is hydronephrosis, if it is close to the pelvis, et cetera, et cetera, you are thinking of obstruction, then better 
order for a diuretic renogram rather than DMSA. But however, if your ultrasound is not uh, seeing any ectopic kidney, then the gold standard is you, the first investigation of choice will be DMSA. However, patient positioning is also crucial. So this is a mistake. Thankfully, we did not uh, commit to it. This is an ectopic kidney. Usually, this is the field of view, which is, uh, you know, the patient is positioned under the camera, the scan is taken. This looked like bladder. However, when we moved the patient, actually he had a pelvic kidney. So both including abdomen and pelvic view uh, during uh, the DMSS scan is very crucial. Again, for horseshoe kidney, coming to renal anomalies, congenital anomalies, which are, or DMSS scan is usually done. If you are planning for, you know, uh, excising one of the either of the moieties, then DMSS scan is very useful in identifying the isthmus, where exactly to excise, excise from. However, if you are looking for, let me say on ultrasound, you find an horseshoe uh, kidney, one of the moieties is hydronephrotic, etc. You want to see whether there is an obstruction or not, then again, you go for diuretic renogram and not DMSA. DMSA is useful just prior to surgery. So this is again how uh, EC scan will look like in a uh, horseshoe kidney. So DMSA scan is more uh, sensitive uh, than intravenous urography, ultrasound, color dropper, etc., to localize the site of infection during an acute pyelonephritis, and it's gold standard for renal scarring. Coming for PSMA PET CT. So, what is PSMA? PSMA is prostate specific membrane antigen. Earlier, uh, the specific scan, there was a specific scan for prostate CA that was prostacent. But uh, most of them, it, it is not utilized uh, these days. This prostacent utilized a particular ligand, which used to go and attach to the prostate cancer, the prostate cells. However, that particular ligand underwent a lot of modifications. And now we have a new ligand, which is very sensitive and specific. So initially, when the prostacent was used, it was, uh, you know, it went into the it was attached to the intracellular part of the particular uh, PSMA, which made it very difficult. You know, once you inject the drug, if it is not attaching to the extracellular part and but the intracellular part, the sensitivity decreases because the number of uh, molecules which are attaching here will be quite less than the extracellular part. So currently what we use is this. So let me, uh, you know, uh, clarify, this is a myth. So that PSMA is very specific for prostate cancer and it is not taken up by any other uh, cells or any other disease. So it is not so 100% specific, specific. It is also expressed in duodenal mucosa, proximal renal tubular cells, mammary ducts and cerebral glands. Any glandular tissue in the body for that matter actually uh, takes up PSMA. Neovascular endothelial uh, cells of uh, all the solid tumors also express PSMA. So this is why these days PSMA is utilized in uh, most of the, you know, non-prostatic malignancy, be it hepatocellular carcinoma, lung, brain, gliomas, etc., etc., PSMA is utilized. However, when it comes to prostate CA, almost 90%, more than 90% uniformly uh, express PSMA. And the one more, uh, uh, what do you say, uh, misinformation, which is there is PSMA is usually more avid or useful in well-differentiated prostate cancer because of the expression, but not in uh, aggressive or more aggressive diseases with Gleason score high. However, that's not the case. PSMA uh, is expressed more in aggressive variants, in fact, as compared to the well-differentiated tumors. So this is just, you know, for theory, uh, what exactly is PSMA? It's just a transmembrane glycoprotein, which is present. Normally, in normal prostate cells, the PSMA is more intracellular and cytoplasmic based. 
whereas during prostate cancer the overexpression occurs and the translocation from PSMA from the apical to luminal surface uh, happens which will allow it to be you know uh, the PSMA to bind to that particular receptors more. How did they come to PSMA? Uh, like most of the IRC studies actually confirm the PSMA ex uh, expressed in 90% of the uh, prostate cancer. So when you have a diagnosed case of uh, prostate cancer, these are few uh, investigations in nuclear medicine which we used to do. Bone scan, choline PET CT, uh, FTG, PSMA PET CT. Still in Europe, people do uh, choline PET CT, but uh, it's almost redundant these days. So this is a FTG PET CT scan, uh, which was done. You can see a large external, left external iliac lymph node which is uh, not picking up uh, FTG because well-differentiated prostate cancer have very low avidity towards FTG. So whenever you think of PET scan, you know, uh, that's the normal word which is used uh, for FTG PET CT. Uh, it is not useful for well-differentiated. However, in later, uh, as the disease progresses, FTG PET CT has a role that I will come later. As you can see, this patient has multiple skeletal metastasis, but the FTG PET scan has not picked up uh, any of the lesions. So FTG is out of question when you are doing it. So coming to prostate CA, diagnosis, we deal with one after the other. Diagnosis, uh, tumor staging, in nodal staging and metastasis. Then comes response assessment and recurrence detection. So we'll go one after the other. So diagnosis is usually clinical, as you all know, biochemical based on the PSA levels. And MRI is the investigation of choice once you have, uh, you know, a clinically suspecting a prostate CA and transrectal ultrasound. What about nuclear medicine scan? Is PSMA PET scan indicated for diagnosis? As of now, none of the guidelines usually uh, tell that PSMA is required for diagnosis. However, there is something called as PSMA guided biopsy. Okay, in people who have done, you know, multiple biopsies have come negative, you are still clinically suspecting that it might be uh, a prostate cancer, the PSA is high, etc. Then you can actually do a gallium PSMA PET CT. And then you can identify the foci, uh, you know, the tumor foci, then go for uh, directed biopsy. Most of the biopsies will come positive. So they had done multiple studies based on uh, gallium PSMA PET CT and PET MRI, etc., which have told that it improves the localization of primary prostate cancers, uh, particularly in biops previously biopsy negative uh, cases. Nodal staging. So this is where PSMA PET uh, stands out. So if you look at the recommendations uh, for nodal staging. At least one cross-sectional imaging is recommended, okay, before you go for surgery. But which cross-sectional is not uh, mentioned? CT and MRI-based uh, yeah, assessment is usually based on the uh, size and morphology of the lymph node. So whether the size is more than uh, one centimeter or morphology with hilum maintained or hilum being uh, with an eccentric hilum or effaced hilum, et cetera, et cetera. So that is morphological assessment which is done on CT and MRI. So pelvic node, it is 8 mm. Uh, the short axis, if it is more than 8 mm, they call it as, uh, you know, uh, the chance of metastasis might be there. Abdominal lymph nodes, that is retroperitoneal, if more than one centimeter, then it is called suspicious. So during baseline, uh, this thing, they tested both CT, MRI and uh, PET scan. The ideal size in uh, CT and MRI still remain inconclusive. They have done ROC analysis of all the uh, lymph nodes which were found, you know, suspicious on uh, CT or MRI. However, the ideal size remained inconclusive. The sensitivity and specificity is quite low. Whereas in PSMA PET CT, multiple meta-analysis and systemic reviews have happened and lymph nodes have been compared with the gold standard histopathology. So the pooled sensitivity and specificity were uh, very high 
as compared to the CT and MR. CT and MR, it's up to 30 to 40%, whereas in TSMA PET CT, the sensitivity was up to 75 to 80%, whereas specificity is more than 95%. So the, these are few of the papers, you know, uh, which assess the accuracy of uh, TSMA PET scan. Either it can be gallium PSMA PET CT or F18 PSMA PET CT, it doesn't matter. Uh, some of the physiological changes are there. You know, when you are using F18 PSMA PET CT, usually it uh, excretes through liver, whereas gallium is excreted through the kidneys and uh, bladder. So PSMA PET, uh, when they look for lymph node staging for intermediate and high uh, risk prostate cancer, in which is included 969 uh, patients. They compared between CT, a multi-parametric MRI, and uh, PSMA, uh, where they have found that uh, it was better than uh, CT uh, and not inferior to multi-parametric MRI. Similarly, in uh, a publication by European Association of Urology, uh, they have told that the LMPSM emission is accurate in detecting uh, lymph node metastasis prior to the surgery. So all these papers, what they have told is, uh, compared to CT, it is far better. Compared to MRI also, it is superior because, because of the lymph node uh, size and morphology. I will just show you an example. So uh, this is an example of uh, well-differentiated prostate CA. CT scan did not show any affected lymph nodes. But on PSMA PET scan, you can see there is beautiful uptake of PSMA on this. If you see the limb CT part of it, it is sub-centimetric, less than 8 mm, and hilum is maintained. If you look carefully, there is a well-demarcated uh, hilum. Even in those, if PSMA is positive, then the suspicion for metastasis will arise. However, I want to uh, stress here that if PSMA is positive, it can still be uh, negative on biopsy, okay, when you do lymph node ex uh, excision, on histopath can be negative. However, PSMA has a very high negative predictive value. If you do a PSMA PET scan and it is negative, that means there are no lymph nodal metastasis. So that's the specificity what PSMA gives you. As you can see here, none of the nodes are enlarged, whereas on PSMA PET CT, you can see a beautiful node right there in the retrocable region. So these are all the cases, you know, which makes PSMA better than all the other morphological imaging. So together, when you're taking on diagnosis, if you want to do, the first scan is multi-parametric MRI, and for nodal and distant metastasis, you can do PSMA PET scan. These together will help uh, complete the staging process. Coming to uh, metastasis, bone scan is the most widely used. I will just touch upon that. Why is bone scan used? Because from the prostate, usually the venous plexus goes to the vertebral plexus. And that is why most of the prostate cancer uh, cases present with bone metastasis or spinal metastasis. So I will just skip this more. Actually, on autopsy, more than 90% of the prostate cancer patients had bone metastasis, that particularly the pelvis and the vertebrae. That's why bone scan is so famous and it is used till now. The sensitivity and specificity is very high for bone scan. Yield of the bone scan is high. However, these are important. The bone scan usually... Yeah, the yield of uh, bone scan that is detecting metastasis is low when the PSMA is PSA level is less than 20 and Gleason score is less than 7. A recommendation as per the NCCN guidelines and other uh, guidelines, bone scan should be performed only in symptomatic patients independent of the PSA level, ISF grade or clinical staging. What about F18 fluoride PET? If it no added advantage is seen, there are multiple papers who have suggested that the sensitivity of F18 fluoride PET CT is better than bone scan. However, overall management change uh, is not so significant. So rather than doing a 3000, 4000 bone scan, there is no need to do a F18 fluoride PET, which will cost you 22,000 or 23,000. Coming to PSMA PET scan, so where does PSMA PET scan actually fare well? Just look at the images. 
if you're doing a, just a ct or mri probably mri might pick up uh, marrow edema or so however on ct scan it looks normal whereas just look at the psma intense psma uptake is seen in relatively normal ct scan that is this is because the prostate uh, cancer cells have infiltrated the marrow uh, but still the sclerosis has not taken place so this is the advantage uh, what a psma because it targets the prostate cancer cells rather than the uh, sclerotic part what happening what happens in bone scan is once the prostate cancer cell, uh, cells metastasize to the bone marrow the bone starts to react to those tumor cells and you know uh, starts to deposit uh, hydroxyapatite crystals that is more osteoplastic activity uh, starts to happen at the site of metastasis and there you see sclerosis to that sclerosis actually mdp is uh, mdp attaches to the sclerotic part rather than the tumor cells so if you do a bone scan in this case it will it is it will probably be negative but psma will be positive look at this the vertebra just looks normal however the psma is positive similarly uh, look at the lower image you have a lytic lesion very rarely we get lytic lesion in prostate uh, cancers particularly in moderately to poorly differentiated prostate cancer we can see lytic images also bone scan is uh, negative in uh, lytic uh, lesions whereas PSM PET CT does not depend on whether it is a sclerotic or lytic lesion. It will be positive on both. And this is an interesting image. You know, this was the baseline. The top two images are baseline studies and below are the uh, uh, study done after uh, uh, giving treatment to the patient. So in the baseline study, the PSMA is positive for metastasis, whereas the CT scan, it is negative. We can't see any morphological impairment on the CT scan. If we had staged this patient using just bone scan or CT scan, etc., etc., it would have been the non-metastatic disease. Whereas post-treatment, you can see sclerosis has developed in the, that particular area. So only on morphological assessment, this would have been called as progression, whereas it is actually complete response. There is no disease actually, only sclero sclerosis is present. So these are the pitfalls of morphological imaging, whereas PSMA is better for assessment also, uh, treatment response assessment. So choline PET CT does not replace bone scan as of now. Choline PET CT is not done in India, actually, most of the places. In, only in Europe they do. PSMA PET CT is superior for bone scan in uh, relation to M staging. And in comparison with whole body MRI also, PSMA PET CT is superior. In conclusion, so for diagnosis, you use PSMA only if uh, previous biopsy is negative. For both, uh, for staging purposes, uh, PSMA PET CT is the gold standard. Thank you. Any questions? I think, Sumit, there are a few questions. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, initially, Dr. Murli had also uh, responded to a few questions of uh, uh, delegates. Uh, I think uh, uh, I will not uh, take that. Uh -huh. uh, one question from Javed says, gallium is excreted by renal uh, bacchidnes. Can it cause relative fast values as, as it accumulates in bladder and uh, near prostate? And number yes, two, um, uh, compared to uh, as it's given from will it be better? Compared to fluorine, as it's given from will it be better? That okay. Is a uh, yeah. Okay. So gallium, since uh, it's a valid question, I will just stop share. Okay. Then I can see the chat box. Okay, sir. So if gallium PSMA is utilized, it does fill into the bladder and it can affect the readings, you know, if the tumor is there right behind the bladder, et cetera, et cetera. However, we inject Lasix in these cases also. So post Lasix view is taken. Once the bladder is, uh, once we ask the patient to void post injecting Lasix, the bladder activity is all gone and we can beautifully see the prostate activity. 
However, F18 is uh, uh, definitely beneficial when you are, you know, in a biopsy negative, uh, previously biopsy negative patient, if you want to pinpoint the foci, you can use F18 PSMA specifically. However, since because of the liver excretion and gut excretion, what happens is the retroperitoneal lymph nodes, uh, if present any, might get obscured when you are doing an F18 PSMA. For staging, I still prefer gallium PSMA PET CT. However, as such, there is no you know difference in using either F18 or gallium PSMA as far as management is concerned. There will be no change. One or two lymph nodes you might miss, but uh, it won't you know. Uh, there is no study comparing F18 versus gallium PSMA, telling that okay, this is superior than the other. Can I add on to that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, see, actually, even in PSMA PET CT, Gleason grade is quite important. Gleason grade 3 plus 3 and 3 plus 4 many a times may not show very high PSMA uptake. Many a times, almost I will say 30 40 percent of the times, especially if serum PSA is on the lower side, less than 5. Whenever serum PSA is less than 5, Gleason grade biopsy proven 3 plus 3 or 3 plus 4. Many a times, PSMA PET CT, whether it is F18 or whether it is gallium 68 PSMA can be very low avidity or maybe even negative. But as Sumit said, in uh, nowadays, as a standard protocol, we give LASIX in most of the patients and we make the patient void a couple of times before taking for the imaging. So the excreted activity in bladder hardly affects uh, PSMA, gallium 68 PSMA interpretation also. And another thing is whenever uh, PSA is high, uptake is less, and there is a clinical suspicion of uh, uh, I mean, biopsy is equivocal and clinical suspicion of malignancy. We take a delayed image. We take delayed image up to two, two and a half, or even three hours after injection. So, in uh, low grade, uh, Gleason grade uh, tumors, there will be slow accumulation or slow concentration of PSMA. So, on even if uh, initial image is negative, delayed image can be positive. So these two things we have to bear in mind. <laughs> One more question uh, which is, I can... Uh, Sumit, this question from Praveen. Yes. Uh, he's asking, supposing you have a suspicion of a normal function kidney based on the contrast CT. Now, this patient has been advised in effect to me so, number one, whether we should do DTP or DMSA, and if you have to choose which which, which one should be the ideal. Easy. EC diuretic renogram. We have seen CT, uh, contrast CT showing thinned out parenchyma, et cetera, et cetera. But most, uh, we, as we have seen at our institute also, these patients can have functional uh, renal parenchyma only because of the gross hydronephrosis on CT it appears like that. So by doing DMSA, you can just get the split function. Whether to operate or not to operate, you can, we can answer using DMSA. However, what EC will provide you is it can provide you the split function also to decide for or against uh, nephrectomy. Also, it will tell whether it is obstructed or non-obstructed. So, both information you are getting, kindly go ahead with EC scan, diuretic renogram. Yeah. No, no. His question is probably he has made some impression from the CCT. Uh, he has found a calculus uh, with the uh, hydrophosphorus with hindered or less some... Um, there is some reason to suspect that this uh, contrast not uptake was not good and all that as compared to his kidney is not lit up. And okay. he, uh, he is thinking that probably this kidney will come out. So okay. in that case, whether he should be doing Either DTPA. of the two. Yeah, not DTPA, definitely. Go with DMSA or EC. Either will do. Uh -huh. so so I'll I should... add on to that. I will add yeah. on to that. Yes, so yeah, so whenever, uh, as you see on contrast CT, the kidney is non-functional. The contrast CT, there may not be contrast uptake whenever split function is less than 25%, as high as 25% split function. For example, one kidney is 25%, other kidney is 75%. In that 25% of functioning kidney, uh, iodinated contrast may not go up. So, and if you decide uh, nephrectomy based only on CT, I think definitely there may be a medical legal implication. Even though there are no guidelines as such, but if you plan nephrectomy based only on CT scan, I think there may be an issue. Secondly, 
uh, suppose in such case uh, many a times it has happened to me on a contrast ct there is uh, no contrast uptake but the parenchymal thickness is preserved and on an ec or dmsa there is no uptake that can happen whenever there is acute pyelonephritis so uh, all these obstructed system or uh, uh, infected system something called as stunning happens because of the inflammation the uh, cortical uptake will be very less so in such cases if the parenchymal thickness is preserved and ec or dmsa is not showing uptake again you cannot base nephrectomy based only on that thing so in such cases what i will recommend is uh, you do a pcn give an antibiotic course uh, may and repeat a scan after maybe one or two or uh, two months and then decide for nephrectomy in today's era where uh, medical legal uh, i mean doctors are under very tremendous stress it is always better to be defensive rather than aggressive yeah i think that only your point is uh, well taken this is again the teaching for uh, the residents and this probably should be the rule uh, based on cct you should never uh, plan your procedure especially when you are uh, doing an nephrectomy uh, it has to be complemented with some sort of uh, uh objective evaluation by uh, a nuclear study uh, uh, you can plan whatever um, uh, a choice can be the way you suggested or the ratio may suggest now uh, this is a point brought out by shreya suji from the textbook of urology uh, so maybe if you can read it uh, the, the is is all related to uh, dmsa uh, in comparison to mag3 and dtp and measuring the yes. uh, the function so he also brings the fact that probably dmsa may be better um, uh, again um, dr mulli has already uh, um, stated how dmsa is better uh, and uh, if you can just uh, uh, complement what he has uh, sir again we have to look here uh, that they have compared mag3 with dmsa in an grossly hydronephrotic kidney ec the extraction fraction of ec is better so if they had compared ec ec is not available in usa us only mag3 is available that's why they do studies only with mag3 however if we had compared ec probably it would have been same uh, but again uh, either ec between ec and dmsa if you are planning for uh, nephrectomy then you can go with uh, either of the two however uh, if you are still you know uh, you want to get additional information on obstructed uh, uh, outflow tract then you can just go ahead with ec it will be equally good uh, there are papers published in urology itself see campbell is i think mainly an american publisher but there are articles published in urology journal of urology itself that Uh, they have compared between ec and mag3 and they have shown that ec is better than mag3 so they and the theoretically pharmacokinetically and logically and even by our experience we have seen ec is much better than mag3 yeah so i i think um, um, what usually i also believe for all scans i I'll, i'll prefer ec and uh, dmsa i'll put it for uh, i think this especially role in cortical abnormalities the scars uh, the ectopic kidneys uh, probably that makes more sense in the background of you are when you are doing uh, the evaluation of a patient uh, you have uh, 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 you want to skip mcu and you top down or bottom up approach or whatever uh, you are planning but for all practical purposes we also as sumit says in our institution we follow um, the 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 eca is our favorite investigation and uh, sometimes we sometimes when we write also that uh, so with you choose whatever is there <laughs> and so with also we we'll also say i do any thing in your case this it ends up like that i will just uh, share one i will just share one uh, ex- uh, in my experience there was one police recruit okay some 22 year young recruit on an ultrasound scan only one kidney was uh, seen then he was referred for a dmsa scan on dmsa also we saw only one kidney but uh, that poor fellow had been rejected once that you don't have a kidney and you are not uh, fit for uh, police recruit and he was the only breadwinner now what do, he pleaded like anything this was our first experience when i was doing md i am telling you and he pleaded with us sir please prove that 
beyond that that i don't have another kidney if even if i have a small functional kidney i may have some chance of getting so then we went ahead and did an ec scan on an ec scan uh, in the initial phases the left one kidney was not seen but as soon as the other normal kidney cleared completely and on a post void image when the bladder also come uh, cleared completely we could see one small left kidney that is because we have something called a sun and star effect when a normal functioning kidney all the isotope goes there it is in the it becomes like a sun all the isotope is there and the normal uh, affected kidney is not seen the difference in the counts is so high when in delayed images the normal kidney is completely cleared and the affected uh, the small contracted kidney started uh, taking up tracer very slowly and it was seen later we reported that this patient had a i mean that uh, person had a kidney and i think he got a job finally or he went to police and something happened actually yeah yeah this is great because again uh, we have to be very judicious in choosing the uh, study so you need to uh, the all studies are visualized and tailored to what you are looking for so for yeah. this it is not about this not like a blanket statement and just to follow this way you choose the condition and you choose the isotope and plan the study that's the same uh, what the doctor molly and the same is for the reduction and uh, how, how you plan your we what you are looking for what is the aim and uh, that's how uh, because it's a science involved uh, different isotopes have different way of uh, getting the uh, sweet heat and sweet heat and um, here yeah, so uh, this has they have a different role in different conditions i think i don't have uh, any person that that box so so with this i think on behalf of the school one one question is there yes There is, is one there? question. After androgen deprivation therapy, is PSMA PET CT useful? What cutoff value SUV max you follow for ah, positive? I missed that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Between negative uptake of prostate lesion and lymph node, and is there any correlation between Gleason grade or score with SUV max uptake? Yeah. If you go one by one, first I will take up. Is there any correlation between Gleason grade and score with SUV max uptake? Yes. Gleason grade three plus three and three plus four. uh scv values are quite less uh, we don't as a nuclear medicine physician me or sumit both will agree we don't entirely rely on a cut off of uh, to call something as a lesion versus non lesion what we rely is tumor to background ratio and tumor to surrounding or mediational pool activity so but still if you want a cut off value i will say if a cut off of uh, more than 4 is there then chances of malignancy is slightly higher but uh, acute prostatitis can also uh, sometimes confound but gleason grade 4 plus 4 4 plus 5 5 plus 4 definitely psma there will be very very high uptake but in gleason grade 5 plus 4 or 5 plus 5 if there is a small cell d differentiation then gleason uh, i mean psma uptake reduces and fdg uptake increases so if you ask this uh, first question after androgen deprivation therapy is psma pet ct useful yes psma pet ct is the investigation of choice after androgen therapy whether uh, uh, for failure or biochemical failure or this one the spot salvageability psma pet ct is the investigation of choice but on a psma pet ct if you see lot of structural disease but no psma uptake one should suspect small cell d differentiation and in such cases we recommend fdg pet ct also and nowadays for androgen depression therapy you know we have lutetium 177 psma ligand therapy also so even before lutetium therapy uh, most of the guidelines say you do fdg pet ct also and assess the discrepancy between psma uptake versus fdg uptake and then decide whether chemotherapy is beneficial or whether psma therapy is beneficial so uh, definitely Uh, PSMA PET CT is the first investigation of choice after uh, androgen deprivation therapy. Uh, that's correct. Okay. Now, um, yeah, that, that's that's all. One new message has come. Let me see what is this. Uh, yeah, that is a thanks. So, Patik Thank has connected to you for answering his uh, uh, questions. Uh, okay. So, it's the time to sign off on behalf of Indian School of Urology. Many thanks to Dr. Murli. Dr. Sumit for sparing their valuable time and uh, uh, reasons for you. Uh, this uh, um, presentation or this webinar will be in USA TV archives. 
if your friends or colleagues have missed it, please uh, ask them to have uh, a revisit this on the USA TV. This is one of the excellent and very comprehensively covered talks. I, you, if you go to the books, I think if you read the first para, you will be put off and you won't continue with that. The way they have put all the all the slides, everything was so nicely covered and everything, every word was important. So you can uh, revisit during the time of your preparation of exams. You can, whenever you're free, again go through and, and recommend to your colleagues also to, uh, tomorrow it will be online. So they can also just uh, visit the pages of USA TV. And for some also, if a departmental, uh, your colleagues and your students, uh, they want to see, you can just refer uh, our USA TV. You can put a date and just put radio integration and imaging they will get it. With this, uh, thanks very much and thanks all the delegates. Thanks to Namit and Kiran for the, from the US Central Office USA for the logistics. So thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, sir. You, sir. thank you so much thank for you. this opportunity.